Okay, now we get to look at the flavor compounds. I'm not going to go into chemistry type depth on this, but I think it's important that we know what kind of flavor compounds are causing the off flavors and pleasant flavors and aromas that we experience whenever we get to bite into a big juicy piece of steak. So the different ones we have here, the fatty acids, which we also have the branch chain fatty acids, those are very important, um, as well as the free fatty acids. Uh, sulfur compounds, pyrazines, pyridines, hydrocarbons, furans, alcohols, and esters, and nucleotides. So the fatty acids, there's two main types to be um, knowledgeable about, the free fatty acids and the branch chain fatty acids. So the free fatty acids have the greatest impact, implications for flavor. Um, that's because of all the bonding potential that they have. The data has been really limited on them. Surprisingly, I couldn't find a whole lot about them uh, within the two books and a couple of papers I was able to read on it. But 99% uh, of the fatty acids in lamb and 85% of them in beef and pork are oleic, stearic, and palmitic acids. So those three fatty acids account for the majority of the free fatty acids in all species. We're actually looking into palmitic uh, palmitic acid right now and seeing what the effects that have um, on the feed in the ovine species. So I'm looking forward to seeing what that does after I've read and realized how much of those free fatty acids um, palmitic, stearic, and oleic are. Uh, the branch chain fatty acids, they're <clears throat> really affected, excuse me, <clears throat> by diet, species, the tissue source, um, meaning the muscle or what the fat source, <clears throat> the concentration and type. The iso and antesio acids, the most common um, in cattle and sheep, and the methyls with the BCFAs with the methyls at the fourth carbon seem to have the most off flavors. So that's something that uh, scientists noted whenever they were looking at the branch chain fatty acids. They've been a little bit more well documented in the free fatty acids to this point. Um, moving on, I wanted to kind of post this table up here so you can get an idea of the percentages of each within uh, each species. So you think that pigs would be drastically different from cattle and sheep, but it seems that all three are eerily similar. The two that I would point out to you would be oleic. That's got a, at the bottom, that has a 4% difference. And if you look at the top, you can see that oleic also has a significant difference um, in the <clears throat> cattle, sheep, and pigs. So there's just a, you can kind of peruse that and see the differences for yourself. I thought it was just pretty interesting, especially in, when you're looking at like uh, the hexadecanoic acid that sheep do not even have. Okay, moving on to our sulfur compounds. These compounds are usually formed during cooking. Um, a lot of them occur or happen due to the free sulfur, sulfidryl groups. So cooked pork can contain 1 to 1.3 times as much um, as beef. So that can contribute to the pork flavor that we know and love. The alphatic sulfur compounds actually account for 50% of the total volatiles in beef that have been cooked for one hour. So the scientists went in and roasted the beef and they took the headspace um, not only from the uh, cooking procedure, but they actually took it and cooked it a little bit more, just seared it by itself, and they had were able to figure out that 50% of those volatiles were alphatic sulfur compounds. <clears throat> when you cooked it for four more or for three more hours, so a total of four hours, you sh you saw a lot more heterocyclic sulfur compounds increasing. This basically means that you're getting a lot more of the ring formation there uh, with your sulfur compounds, which would cause a more intense odor. 4-methyl and 4-ethyl octanoic acids, they have high concentrations in lamic tissue, so these sulfuric compounds are what accounts and makes up for quite a bit of our uh, lamb flavor, we found out. But if you look at mutton, you see biz, and you're going to have to excuse me on this one, or methyl sulfide and methionine 
and those are the ones that really impact that mutton flavor and drive it home. Now you see an in included in there that methyl octanoate down there at the bottom, but it's not as prevalent in mutton. It's more prevalent within the younger lambs. Um, that's why we believe that that's not as big a contributor to the off flavor that mutton gives you. Pyrazines, we're just going to briefly go through all these different classes, just give you a basic knowledge on them. Um, I'm going to try and get a structure for each one of these put together so you can have the actual structures uh, to look at while you're going through this lecture. But pyrazines, they increase with the heating time, so the longer you roast it or smoke it, um, you're going to see those pyrazines increase. Well, what's interesting is they're also associated with underdone boiled or microwave cooked beef. So we were talking a little bit earlier about how the importance of the order in which those volatiles are, those fatty acids are, or in this order is important. So that's why they can be associated with not only the longer heating time or roasting, but they can also be associated with the underdone, boiled, or microwave cooked beef. So this is just not super um, prevalent in a grilled or a uh, seared steak so they're more in your longer cook times as you can see they're going to be two the period prozine and four acetyl methylpyrimidine both are associated with the roast beef odor so you'll get these in your longer cook times um, pyridines are part of that same thing so you get those from under roasting proline and glucose they're, they react and that's how pyridines are produced um, the three ways with aldehyde ammonia interactions, the Maillard reaction, and paralysis of amino acids. These pyridines are going to be more prevalent in uh, seared steaks and the grilling side, so the kind of the opposite of what the pyrazines are, or I should say just in a higher ratio to the pyrazines in a uh, more intense high heat cooking method, short time frame. Hydrocarbons and purines. So the hydrocarbons, you have the low and the high molecular weight. Um, the higher the molecular weight, the more well done the beef and pork usually are. I didn't see anything in reference to lamb with hydrocarbons. I'm sure there's been some work done in regards to that. Um, purines are actually, actually derived from fat, so their precursor is fat. Um, you think that during the male, it's thought that during the Maillard reaction, the furins are released and the uh, thermal decomposition of thiamine contributes to that. Also, those ribonucleotides they um, and help to enhance the release of the furins. Um, they can react react with the sulfur compound that H2S to produce that roast beef odor. So uh, they're prevalent in pretty much everything. Uh, furins are one way that you can see how well done something is in terms of their ratio by looking at their ratio. So we're going on a vari variability in odor and taste. We have the species effects, so that would be the lamb uh, taste that we talked about. We identified those compounds. Um, the breed, we said in the earlier lecture, has a small impact. Uh, the age of the animal, so it's interesting that beef flavor is increasing until about 18 months. So 16 to 18 months is the average that most cattle are slaughtered in the U.S. So right as their flavor is peaking um, or plateauing, they're getting slaughtered. So that's good for us because we're getting all the flavor that we want. Um, sheep and goat, however, continue to increase in their species-specific flavors long after 18 months. I think that uh, what I read was about three years of age that they tend to plateau off in terms of species-specific flavors, which at that point nobody really wants to eat them. Oh, nobody even really wants them ground, so it becomes a lot harder to utilize the older lamb and goat operations here in the U.S. So the amount of mono versus polyunsaturated fats increases, which just makes sense. The more saturated the fat, the harder it is to break down, the um, more energy that's required. We already went through lipolysis, so we all understand that. But we do get improved flavor from it and less oxidation, so that's the important part of the mono versus polyunsaturated, you get less oxidation from the less binding sites that are open and available. Muscle variations, one we talked briefly about, 
So the biceps femoris has the highest intensity in terms of the beef flavor, while the supraspinatus has the lowest intensity. We have one easy way to think about the muscle variation effect is to think about eating a tenderloin steak, which is the psoas major. You can picture all those red muscle fibers and how tender that is. But if you compare that with the flavor of, say, a ribeye or even a strip steak, it's vastly lacking in terms of the explosion of flavor that's produced by that, uh, by that steak every time, each time that you bite into it. So the flavor precursor molecules for those individual muscles haven't been extensively researched, and that could be a new area of uh, opportunity for us as meat scientists to delve into, especially since there is a big push for flavor in the meat science world right now. So we have carbonyls, and carbonyls are ever prevalent. There are over 200 different species, and they're important because they're an indicator of oxidative rancicity. So there's nothing we can do to control those extensively. They're all these minor reactions produce them. Um, they're actually kind of annoying in terms of the control that we have to input to, or to try to input to you negate their effect. Now, they don't have an extreme effect, but they do get the ball rolling and kind of uh, begin the process of oxidative rancicity. We'll talk a little bit about the diet prior to slaughter. So, pork's very easily influenced. Uh, Dr. Stelzlini was talking about how they fed peanuts to pigs and you could just watch the fat drip off of them. So higher in saturated fats in a diet equals higher in saturated pork fat. That's just direct correlation. Um, same would be said of you and me. The room in the diet, however, can affect the flavor. Um, even with all of that that we go through. So we talked about... Uh, a little bit about rumen bypassing, I think, that uh, the big difference is you can affect the flavor more with the rumen bypass fat than you can anything else except for barley and maybe soybeans. Um, that becomes extremely important whenever you're talking about dairy beef. So a large portion of the dairy cattle um, that go to slaughter have had rumen bypass rumen fat bypass fed to them, which could affect the flavor of the of the carcasses. But luckily they're mostly cows, so the ground beef that we get from that would be the one that's affected. So here are just a couple of the different plants that can affect the meat flavor. So I thought it was interesting that the ryegrass was on there and you get a strong uh, meat odor and flavor, which I didn't think that it was a bad thing. All of the grass-fed beef that I've had has been on ryegrass. It wasn't necessarily unpleasant. Um, it's whenever we get the oh, the green oats flavor or the white clover, um, or especially the rape flavor um, and odor, that I get a really big problem. I just really don't like that fishy kind of taste that's uh, that you get from that. However, the ryegrass beef that I had did not seem to be as uh, objectionable to me in terms of that grassy flavor. Now I will tell you that whenever I was in Australia for a while, we were of course in college. Um, everybody's poor in college, so we decided to go bargain shopping for beef. We went to the grocery store. They only have one chain there. Um, we really excited because we saw some very, very nice tenderloins that were deeply discounted and on sale because the Australians, they like lean beef. So they like to see a lot of red and they don't want a whole lot of, they want they don't want to buy a whole lot of marbling anyway. So we get to pick out the great marbled beef. So we soon learned the reason they don't like that marbled beef is because it has a more intense grass-fed flavor. So it's not very pleasant whatsoever. That was a great lesson for me in terms of grass-fed beef to get to eat that discounted tenderloin that I was so excited about. <laughs> so we also have the sex effect in pork. Um, this one's something that actually is the only thing that's ever turned me off bacon for any amount of time. 
the boar taint, which uh, is due to a large quantity of ostrichins. So the big player in this is skatol, and that's been linked directly to boar taint in numerous studies. And we just need to castrate the animals in order to um, negate this effect. So castration is a really big part of eliminating boar taint. The problem comes we get some wild hogs and we're all excited to go hunting and get them. But if you have ever smelled a boar, you smell a boar tainted boar, you will know it. It's a very distinct smell and the flavor that comes off of that is really very horrible. Um, I mentioned that it turned me off bacon. It turned me off bacon for two weeks after I was trained in its flavor. It was something that you shouldn't really ever have to be trained in. Um, but you can't say no to major professors. So, uh, funny fact is that 44% of men are unable to detect boar odor, um, and only 8% of women are unable to. So women are more highly skilled and highly trained and make a little bit better panelists, actually, in terms of consumer panels than men do. They've got a more delicate palate, usually. Well, I hope you've enjoyed these lectures, and I really had fun getting to put this together. Uh, thank you for sticking with me, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I would love to answer and talk to everybody who has an opinion on this. I hope that you all have a great rest of the week, and look forward to hearing from you.